But prior to that, he was at Tesla where he helped build Gigafactory One. So one of the comparisons to touch on would be the fact that we've assembled a world-class team. Welcome to the NAI 500 CEO interview program, where the senior management from select listed companies will share the insights with the audience about the company's growth potential. In this episode, we had the opportunity to speak to Ali Haji, the CEO of Iron Energy, the TSX venture listed company with a trading symbol of ION. Island Energy is a living inspiration company focused in Mongolia. A few highlights our readers should know before watching the interview. Island Energy is trying to be the first living brine explorer and producer in Mongolia, having a strong team who has a track record to support such execution. The projects are strategically located in Mongolia, close to China's border, where the country is the world leader in manufacturing lithium batteries and continues to outpace the globe in demand of EVs. The company has the largest exploration license ever granted in Mongolia for its Vavai Wu project, first drilling program already complete last year. The share price reached its 52-week high last November. Since then, has corrected and now trading at 35 and 40 cent range. If you enjoy our video, please like, comment, and subscribe to our channel so you can stay alert for future content. Hi, Ali. How are you doing today? Doing very well, Gilbert. How are you? Doing great, also. So maybe you can just. Uh, Give us a uh, overview and background about your company, Ion Energy, to begin with. Sure. Um, Ion Energy was co-founded in uh, 2017. Uh, we went public on the Toronto Stock Exchange and the venture market uh, here in August 2020. Uh, Ion Energy is an early stage lithium brine explorer in uh, Mongolia. We currently control 110,000 hectares of highly prospective brine licenses across two licenses uh, in the southern areas of Mongolia. And we commenced exploration shortly after having gone public in August. The team is comprised of some industry veterans, uh, if you will, uh, and I'm happy to, to get into those, but I think a lot of that information is available to our viewers uh, on our website. Great, it's pretty interesting. You're exploring lithium potential in Mongolia. So what's the main difference compared to the common places like exploring or mining lithium in South America? Good question. You know, South America is generally speaking at a higher altitude. The assets would be located in, in rather remote locations. Uh, so it is quite taxing and quite, uh, you know, expense driven in terms of getting to those assets to ultimately extract uh, the lithium. The higher altitude does aid in the evaporation process. Mongolia, on the other hand, is relatively flat. We're located in, in, a, in a very flat basin that spans uh, the vast majority of the southern portion of the country. Uh, a lot of the salars in Mongolia are paleo salars, and what that means is that the aquifers are buried as opposed to being on surface, which you will find in the Atacama or in Chile, as you rightly pointed out. Um, so in terms of the, the geology, uh, there's a bit of a difference, but in terms of the quality that we're seeing coming out of the ground in Mongolia, uh, the vast majority of it is of uh, significant, if not better quality than what you would find in South America. Okay, so... Tell us a bit more about uh, what, what kind of work have you done so far with your uh, living projects there and what kind of work are you planning to advance these projects in uh, this year? Of course. So we went public in August 2020 on the Toronto Stock Exchange, the venture market, uh, you know, during a time when the world was locked down, essentially in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, the goal there was let's ensure that we can go public so we can begin to do some work on our assets. Historically, when we went public, we had one asset, the Babayol asset, 81,000 hectares in Sukhpatar province, about 23 kilometers from the Chinese border. That had some historical work done on it back in 2016 by the University of Science and Technology in Mongolia, where surface samples, I beg your pardon, were obtained. Uh, they were sampled. We had maximum grades close to 8, 11 ppm, average grades of 423 ppm. Since we went public in August 2020, we defined a drilling program where we did an RC program, allowing us to understand the stratigraphy of the basin in place. Uh, we drilled over 832 meters. We then paused for a, a quick moment as a result of uh, supply chain issues and everything else that the world has had to face before diving into an extensive 222-hole ogre, ogre program across the entire uh, 81,000 hectare license. That bore fruit uh, for us as a company. In December, we were able to announce up to 1,502 ppm uh, lithium content. And that, of course, is almost twice the 811 ppm that we had seen prior to us being granted the license. 
So very exciting for us in that remit. And as a result of that, we have now planned uh, the course of uh, exploration over the course of 2022, which will include uh, a number of uh, TEM, micro seismic uh, uh, geophysic uh, activities alongside some uh, RC and auger drilling, uh, as well as some hydrogeological sampling, which will allow us to pull up those brine samples and have them assayed and, and uh, sampled at Baba Iol, hoping to get to an advanced sort of resource calculation or a resource estimate, if you will, in Q3, Q4 of this year. So a big year for Baba Iol, but we're Gachnaran, which is our secondary asset that we acquired in February last year. Uh, very little work was done on that asset. It is considered very much to be greenfield. However, the indication and the geology of the region uh, points to uh, a significant salar. That salar actually resides very close to surface, so it's not a paleo salar like you would find at Baba Iol. And the goal for the company is to, to put 73 holes uh, in the ground at Urgachnar uh, this year as well. In fact, uh, that drilling will commence in the next week. So for our listeners, when you do listen to this, you will very likely see a press release associated with that. Uh, but that program will commence uh, in the coming week or so. And the intent there is much the same as uh, the earlier program done on Baba Hill. So let's de-risk by scratching the surface and determining where we should put the vast majority of, of our effort in the future. So it looks like a lot of uh, activities coming along for the investors to follow for your company these days. Absolutely. And I think, Albert, you know, that's a result of the world opening up. Uh, we now have the ability to get out uh, and, and visit site. In fact, uh, myself, including my technical team and one of my senior advisors, uh, will be in Mongolia in April uh, this year. So April 15th, we arrive, we do a site visit, uh, and we kick off uh, this very capital intensive exploration program that allows us to better understand our assets. Yeah, so lithium companies have gained a lot of interest from the investment community these uh, few years. So there's a lot of competition out there. And how do you compare yourself, your company, to your peers? Let's say about the potential or valuations uh, from that point of view. Of course, uh, from a comparison perspective, you know, first off, let me start by saying, you know, I did talk about a team that we've assembled, and that team includes the likes of Paul Fornitsari who was the original chairman of Lithium Americas, uh, a founding director of Neo Lithium, which recently sold to Zijin in China uh, for $960 million last quarter. Uh, we've also assembled a team that includes Don Haynes, a very prominent expert in the lithium brine space, alongside Mark King, another individual that's very well recognized in the lithium spheres. Uh, we also have an individual by the name of Dr. David Deeks, who's on our advisory board. He was the ex-CTO and senior vice president of Lithium Americas. Uh, but prior to that, he was at Tesla, where he helped build Gigafactory 1. So one of the comparisons to touch on would be the fact that we've assembled a world-class team uh, relative to some peers that, that might be uh, lesser uh, endowed, if you will, in terms of their technical prowess. The second thing that I would say is that uh, we are a relatively new company. We've only been trading for about a year and a half now, whereas a number of these other companies have had you know, five, six years. They've perhaps ridden one, gone through one or two cycles where they've been able to do a fair bit of work and de-risk their assets. We're just getting started. The other comparison I would draw upon is the fact that we are fully funded. So we're not looking for an equity raise. We had 4 million in the bank at the end of last year. And as a result of that, we're not looking to raise capital because that keeps us going for about two years time. And last but not least, um, I think from a uh, peer comparison perspective, we are massively undervalued and that can be seen uh, based on the research reports that you will find on our website that have been put out in press releases as well. I think there's a bit of a gap that needs to be filled from a valuation perspective. The analysts agree, and we're on the cusp of doing a fair bit of exploration that allow us to close that exploration gap as we go forward. Great, so that's brought us to the last question in terms of summarizing what we just talked about. So why do you think the investors should be considering investing in iron energy right now? As I said, uh, we believe Ion Energy is well positioned to serve Asia's lithium demand. We are a team comprised of industry experts with a vast amount of experience. We are fully funded and we are only 23 kilometers from the largest consumer on the planet, that being China. So Ion Energy has a lot to prove this year, a lot of good things to come, and I hope that you can follow our story. Thank you, Ali, for your time here to share your story with us here. Thanks very much. Happy to be here.